This video tutorial is compatible with Photoshop CC and Photoshop CS6. In this second foundation project, we'll look at how to take an image that came out of the camera looking like this and regain some of the detail and add in some stylization so that we end up with an image that looks like this. So to start with, what we need to do is select the before photo from the book's DVD, right click and open it into Camera Raw. Once inside Camera Raw, the first step is for us to actually apply some lens corrections. Now, in the last couple of versions of Adobe Camera Raw, we have the ability to apply some very sophisticated lens corrections. In particular, we have both an automated and a manual way of applying these corrections. With this particular image, we actually have a profile available for correcting the photo. So we will select Enable Lens Profile Corrections from the Lens Corrections panel. Go down and choose Auto. Select Sony from the list of makes that are available there. And automatically it should come up with the Sony DT18-200 lens and the profile associated with that. Now, applying a lens correction in this way helps correct things like lens distortion and vignetting, and even provides options for removing chromatic aberration. So we'll make sure that that option is selected as well. In addition to these corrections that are applied via a profile that's specifically designed to correct problems associated with a particular lens, we have the option of doing some manual adjustments as well. So we can correct distortion, vertical and horizontal perspective, rotate the image if we want, and also apply some scaling. I'm happy with what we've done with the auto options in the profile corrections, and that we've been able to find a profile that's associated with the lens that we shot the image for, with in the first place. Now let's go about applying some cropping and straightening to the image. First of all, we'll go and select the Straighten tool and drag it across this portion of the shed, which is meant to be horizontal. This will automatically apply a crop to the image as well. So we'll just go and select another tool and the crop will be applied and the horizontal components of the shed will be straightened as well. So that's looking pretty good. Now let's set our workflow options. Remember we can access those using the hyperlink at the bottom of the workspace. If we open it up you'll notice that the color space has been set to sRGB. It's better if we use Adobe RGB which is bigger or even Profoto RGB which is the biggest of all of the options that are there so that we have more ability to massage the colors and the tones in our image. The same thing applies to the bit depth. We should select 16 bits per channel so that we have more levels of tone to play with when we're making adjustments. We can also choose the crop size here and the one that's selected by default is the one that matches the actual pixels captured by our camera. We can downsample or upsample from here at any point. And finally we have resolution, which by default is at 240 pixels per inch, which is great for printing. And then the settings for sharpening, which should be adjusted to the type of output that you're looking for. So if you're going to screen, glossy paper or matte paper. And if you want standard, low or high sharpening options. We can also choose to open the images up as smart objects instead of actually working with them as a converted file inside Photoshop. At the moment I'll leave this deselected because we're just going to be doing most of the processing inside Camera Raw and I can actually make that decision later when I'm taking the file into Photoshop. Now let's adjust the colour and the tone of the image so we'll go back to the basic panel and uh, we can use the white balance selection as shot or we can go down to daylight because we have some flash here that we've used in the foreground and daylight coming in from the background uh, so that's looking not too bad if you want to warm it up slightly or then you could move the colour temperature uh, control from left through to right to add a little bit of warmth to the image as well where we're adding some yellow back into the photo. 
Remember that with Adobe Camera Raw 7 there's been some changes to the way in which the tonal controls have been laid out. Exposure no longer sets the white clip point, instead it adjusts the middle values of the image. So first of all what we'll do is adjust the middle values of the image until we get the brightness just about right in this particular part of the photo. Make sure that you set the white and black clipping warnings at the top of the histogram here to ensure that they're actually set for the image. We can adjust the contrast next to make sure that the brightness and the contrast of the middle values of the image are set first. Next, we'll adjust the clip points of the photo using the whites to adjust the highlight clip point, first of all. So move it up till we just start to see some clipping, then just drag that back until we see no clipping in the image, and then the blacks. So move it down till you see some clipping in the image, and they're the blue portions that you can see in the preview, and then just move it back up until you see no clipping. Double check when you have a look at the two upward facing arrows above the histogram here to check to see that no clipping is occurring in the image. Those should be black. If there's clipping in one particular channel, there'll be a color, or in a couple of channels, there'll be a combination of that color, or if it's clipping across all the channels, then this upward facing triangle will be white. So keep an eye on those. And finally, we can adjust the shadows, which is the brightness of the shadows in the image, and also the whites, which is how dark or light the delicate whites are in the photo. So once we've got those general tonal controls and the white balance sorted, we can then move on to the next step in the process. The final tweaks in the basic pane are clarity, vibrance and saturation. Clarity provides the ability to add some more local contrast into the image. So rather than being contrast across the whole of the photo, it's more contrast around objects and tends to make them stand out. So we don't want to use too much of that, otherwise the image starts to look a little bit gritty. Here it's giving us just the right amount to make portions of the image appear more pronounced without the image appearing more gritty. Vibrance, we can pump up the vibrance to increase the uh, strength of the colour in areas that are desaturated and just pull down the saturation a bit so that we haven't got too much colour in the rest of the image. This blue shirt is still a bit distracting so this is one of the areas that we could apply some local correction to the image by reducing the strength of the colour of this part of the image. Once we're happy with those settings we'll move on to applying some adjustments to just portions of the image. Up until this point, all of the corrections that we've made to the image have been global corrections. In other words, they've been applied across the whole of the photo. Now what we're going to do is actually start making some changes to just parts of the photo. And this has only been possible in the last few versions of Adobe Camera Raw. And there's two tools that we use to do this, the adjustment brush and the graduated filter. In this example, we're going to use the adjustment brush. So we'll select that first. Notice that the panel changes and in Adobe Camera Raw 7 we have a lot of controls in this adjustment brush panel. All of them can be painted onto the image to make selected changes to just part of the photo. And you can do that with individual controls or a combination of controls. So it should be immediately obvious one of the areas that we would like to make changes to in this photo would be to bring back some detail in this part of the image. Now the detail is there because we've been able to capture it using the raw file format and the dynamic range of the camera, but we just need a mechanism for enabling us to bring that detail out or restoring that detail. So we already know that highlights control the highlight areas of our image and exposures control the brightness of the image. So I'm going to drop the exposure right down and I'm going to drop the highlight right down as well. Then I'm going to use a brush and just brush into the area where we need some extra detail. Now you'll notice it's too dark. This is not a problem. Normally this would be a drama if we were making changes using a burning and dodging brush or something like that. But it's not a problem when we're working with the adjustment brush. Because once we've got the area brushed in, 
we can then come back and fine tune the strength of this effect. So the exposure in the highlight settings might be too strong. So we'll just ease the exposure setting back to the right and also ease the highlight setting back to the right as well. We also might want to increase the contrast because it's looking a little bit flat over there. So we'll increase the contrast so we get a better contrast in the image. We'll drop down the exposure a little bit as well. And you can see how much more detail we've been able to paint back into the photo. This would not have been possible if we weren't working with a RAW file. If we were working with a JPEG file, that detail will have been lost by now. Well, let's go back and click on a new adjustment brush. You'll notice that we have a little flag here that indicates the previous adjustment and the mask, you can see here indicated in red, that's been used to apply that adjustment. And with this next brush, we don't want it quite as strong because we're going to apply the same sort of adjustments, but just in and around the main figures. Like it's a gentle burning in of the detail. So not quite as strong as what we were doing before. But we're able to even out the exposure in our image using these kind of controls. So we've got much more detail now than what we had before and it's distributed more evenly across the image. Let's just add one more adjustment brush and in this case what we're going to do is drop down the strength of the color in this shirt. I'm just going to click on the minus button next to the saturation control here a couple of times and watch what happens when I brush it over the shirt. You'll see that the strength of that blue has been dropped right back. But we want to try and control how that brush work is happening with the image. And you notice the brush's effect is bleeding into the rest of the photo. So I'm just gonna hold down Control or Command and hit Z for the moment to remove that brush from the image. And I'm going to go down and select Auto Mask from the option that we have available here. So that will restrict the effect to just in the boundaries of the shirt because the auto mask setting is trying to restrict where it's applying the changes to just around the shirt itself and not bleeding into the background. It does this by using the contrasty edge of the shirt and the background as a guide for the area that it's trying to adjust. So auto mask is good if you're trying to make your adjustment within the boundaries of a high contrast uh, border. For freeform adjustments like burning in or dodging, it's not as good. So make sure it's turned off. So now we've got our image much more balanced, the tones in our image are much more balanced and we're ready to move to the next step. In true photojournalistic fashion, we're going to change this image into a grayscale now. We're still in the adjustment brush mode, so we need to select another tool to jump out of that mode. We can then go across to the HSL grayscale panel and just click on the convert to grayscale option that you can see here. By just using the auto settings, we've got a reasonably good conversion here, but notice that we have a set of controls sitting in the grayscale mix panel. This enables us to map the particular colors in an image and how they're converted to grayscale. So for instance, we know about the blue shirt that the gentleman on the right is actually wearing. And by adjusting the blues slider here, we can change the density of that shirt in the conversion to grayscale. In other words, what gray the blue is converted to which is really handy when we want to actually adjust how the image looks and maybe push some components of the image back in terms of density and bring other components of the image forward in terms of density. We can do that manually using these controls here or we can go up and use the targeted adjustment tool and select the grayscale mix and just click on an area and drag it up or drag it down in order to change the grey 
that's being used for that particular color. And because Adobe Camera Raw is smart enough to know which color we're working with, it makes the adjustment for you. So it's a very direct way of working when you're adjusting the grayscale mix in your conversion. As well as converting to grayscale, it's also possible for us to apply some split toning to the image. So we can move across to the next tab in the panel area and click on split toning. We have the ability to tone or tint the highlights separate to the shadows. And we have two controls for each area. We have hue, which is the color, and saturation, which is the strength of the color. If I hold down the Alt option as I'm dragging the Hue slider, I will see a 100% or full saturation version of the color being applied through the highlights. So this gives me the ability to select the color first, in this case I'm going for a sepia type look, and then to come back with my finger off the Alt or Opt key and choose the strength of that color. It's a little more difficult choosing the strength of the color if you're using low saturation. So holding the, down the Alt or Opt key can be a great way to preview the color effects. I'm just going to turn off this shadow warning for the moment and then come back and look with the Alt or Opt key down just at providing a slightly blue tint to the shadow areas and drag up the saturation until I can just start to see the hint of blue coming through. So we've got warm highlights and cool shadows. And we can change at what point the highlights are being tinted or the shadows are being tinted. So we can pick where the split is occurring between our highlights and our shadows. To enhance the effect even further, we can go to the FX panel and add in a couple of different stylistic changes to our image as well. At the top we can choose a different types of grain to add to the image. Now this grain is added non-destructively and so can be removed at any time later. By sliding the amount slider we can increase the amount of grain or the strength of the grain in the image and then we've got two other controls as well, size and roughness. To get a good indication about the style of the grain, make sure that you're viewing the image at 100% or more. And I find looking at a fairly smooth area as a good way of checking what the grain looks like and whether it's giving me the type of look that I want for the image. I prefer sharper grain, so I tend to keep the size slider at smaller values. If we just go back to fit and view, we can apply a vignette around the image. By sliding the amount slider towards the left, you'll notice the edges of the image are darkening. But in order to see and predict how this vignette is being applied to the image, if we drag down the feather until we have no feather and just see the sharp edge of the vignette, we then have a better idea about the way in which the vignette is being applied to the photo. So I like to drag down the feather control first, then adjust the roundness of the vignette, and the midpoint before I finally apply the vignette to the photo. Remember to drag your feather back up then in order to soften the transitioning effect and to come back and change the amount slider if you want it stronger or not quite as obvious. Remember there are three different types of vignette that you can apply. Paint overlay is the simplest way of working. Color priority and highlight priority treat the background colors and the background highlights in different ways. When you select highlight priority, you can choose for the highlights not to be tinted. And if you look in the bottom left hand corner of this image, you'll see the effect. So the highlights are maintained through the vignette when you drag up the highlight slider or when you drag it back down to zero, then the vignette is applied through the highlights as well. So they're the two types of special effects we can apply to this image.
The next step in the process is to talk about sharpening and a little bit about noise reduction. Because we're applying a grain effect to the image, I won't talk too much about noise reduction because in this particular image we are actually disguising some of that noise with grain. But in order for you to get a good understanding about how noise reduction works, I'm going to go back to the FX pane and just drag down the grain control for the moment, in other words turning it off. I'll then go back to the detail pane where we have both sharpening at the top and noise reduction below as the two different controls that we're working with. Remember for both these controls we need to actually view the image at 100%. Now because this image was shot on a budget DSLR camera at 800 ISO, well then we definitely can apply some noise reduction in order to reduce some of the grittiness to the image and there's two types of noise reduction that we can actually apply to the photo. First is luminance noise reduction, which is, tends to be the, I guess, spottiness or grain that you would normally associate with the image. And it typically occurs across the whole of the image and is mostly called grayscale noise. There's a second type of noise, and that's the color noise, which we won't see here because we converted to grayscale, but it's the errant red, green, and blue pixels that sit in your image, generally if you photograph with long exposures and generally in the shadow areas. So we don't particularly need to use that one at the moment because we've converted to grayscale. Luminance will just push up a little bit, and you'll see the difference here. We've got smoother skin tones. Sharpening, we've got four different slider controls with the sharpening. Amount controls the strength of the sharpening, and you can see as I drag it up that there is a distinct change in the crispness of the image. But notice also that you'll get extra texture, perhaps not texture that you want, associated with the sharpening. So make sure you are a little careful with your detail slider, because detail can add extra clarity, but also can add extra grittiness to the image that you mightn't want. In this particular type of photo, it's not really an issue, because we're going for that photojournalist, social documentary type, grainy, old school photo. And remember, you can always use your masking option to restrict where your sharpening is being applied to. So if I hold down the Alt or Opt key and gradually drag this up, you'll see that we're applying a mask to the image and the black areas will restrict the action of the sharpening. And so you won't get any sharpening applied there, but you will get sharpening applied to the white areas. And so what we've been able to do is restrict the sharpening from the skin tone area and only apply it around the high contrast areas of the image. But with this photo, we're not too concerned about that because we want some of the grittiness showing through. So that's all looking good. Let's go back to the FX panel now and just dial in some of that grain. So we have applied some sharpening and we've also had reapplied the grain back to the image itself. With all our adjustments complete, the only thing left is for us to apply the adjustments back to the raw file, which we can do by clicking done or opening the image into Photoshop, in which case the raw file will be converted to a flat file PSD. Or if we hold down the Shift key, you'll notice that we have another option here called Open Object. And basically this means we take the raw file, we encase it in a smart object, and then open that into Photoshop. So let's just do that and I'll show you what the result is. So here we have the image now sitting within Photoshop CS6. If we go and look at the Layers panel, you'll see that we have a Smart Object Layer sitting here, with the RAW file sitting inside. If I right-click on that Smart Object Layer and go down to Edit Contents, then the image will open back up in Adobe Camera RAW. If I then make a change to that image, so for instance, let's turn off the grayscale conversion, so it's back to color now, and just click OK, the image will update the smart object back inside Photoshop. And all of this occurs non-destructively. So there's no changes in a destructive fashion to the original pixels that were captured by the camera. So this is a very clever way of working and maintains the editability of the raw file during the whole process. 
I'll just go back to edit contents again, jump back into Adobe Camera Raw, turn back on our Convert to Grayscale option and click OK. And we'll be back with our sepia tone image.